Well, uh, thank you for your patience, guys. Apparently, uh, technology is not our thing. Doing so well up into the Q and A. Um, I thought when I employed Rob and Nathan, we would have got the technology sorted. But <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, too hard for us. Um, but we're on. Uh, you'll be joining us, so we're just going to talk for a couple of minutes while you join us. But we'll talk about what we were, what you were trying to lip read. <laughs> What you were trying to lip read? I've got a football game coming up for some reason. Right. Um, we're um, we're chatting about the Lake Mac Facebook page and what a great joy it's been for me with my kids each week to uh, sit down and watch the thoroughly entertaining uh, kids church videos that Nathan's been putting together with his uh, visiting speaker Jared. But this week, if you want to see Nathan in Coralie's clothing and learn about the new birth. Uh, yeah, that's on our Lake Mac Kids Facebook page. Uh, it's a private page, so it's for, for you if you've got kids and you're part of the Lake Mac family, if you'd like to join that. Uh, send us a message on Facebook, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll hook you up with that. I'll just speak up. Uh, we'll have to, uh, yeah, we can hook you up with that, but that's been, been great to be watching those kids' church videos. Mm. Yeah, how's Brookie found them? Yeah, yeah, I'm amazed how much Brooke's getting out of them. Mm. Uh, I was, uh... I didn't think she'd get much, but, but Nathan's done such a good job that, that she, you know, the other week she was asking, where's Jesus, how do we find Jesus? And she was able to get to the point. He's in the Bible. Which is, uh, yeah, wonderful. So and that's a real joy, you know, she's missing her friends so much. Uh, so she loves getting on there and seeing when people are up to stuff. So mm. it's a really good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, now... Uh, I think without any further delays, we can jump into some questions. Uh, and so we had a few come through, and do keep sending them. If you want to just pop them on the comment stream there, or you can send a text to me. Um, uh, so the first question mm. is from Alan. So I'm going to run with Alan's question, and I'll just find it here. So here we go. The Ezekiel passage seems to be about the return of the exiles, but it explains the passage very well. Is he talking about Israel, Jesus, mm. or both? Yeah, great question, Alan. Um, so one of the one of the things you'll notice, especially as we look through the promises in the Old Testament. So uh, in our Bible, we've obviously got the the two halves, the Old and the New Testament. And a lot of the, well, all of the Old Testament ultimately is pointing forward to the, to the fulfillment of God's plans. Uh, and we find out that they are fulfilled in Jesus, uh, in his, uh, his coming, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and finally his return. So all of what the Old Testament is talking about actually is pointing forward to this, this end point in Jesus. Um, but what we do see, especially in the prophets, in some of the promises God makes, God, God okay. makes to his people. Um, we, we see um, multiple fulfillments of those promises. Often there's a, an immediate short-term fulfillment and then a much greater longer-term fulfillment. Uh, at passages like this passage in Ezekiel 36, uh, which, which I talked to you to in the sermon, um, pretty clearly were not fulfilled uh, by the return from the exile. Um, so in an element it was, there was some of it was, God did bring his people back from uh, where they'd been exiled uh, to Babylon, but there wasn't the fulfill full fulfillment of that. They, they weren't cleansed, they weren't given new hearts, they weren't given new spirit. Um, that very clearly didn't happen until the coming of Jesus. And when Jesus uh, died, rose again, and then sent his Holy Spirit to his followers. Um, so so that's, a, that's a great, I think, a great illustration of a, an immediate short-term fulfillment, but in the context, you say you can see pretty clearly this was not talking about that, just about that immediate return from exile. It was always looking further, uh, and, and we, we we say that again and again as we we look through these Old Testament promises. Um, but yep, great great question. Uh, feel free to ask more if that didn't answer it properly. Great. Uh, next question. So I've got. Uh, another one, uh, similar in that it's looking back to the Old Testament um, uh, and, and trying to wrap the head around that mm. then and now kind of stuff. And it's come from Robin. Uh, so, 
she's asking, so um, what's the deal with God? So she's talking about the, the bronze snake uh, that gets referenced in today's passage. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's the deal with the, uh, God getting the Israelites to look at this image? So kind of, you can see it fits really well with Jesus and being raised up, but mm -hmm. then how does that work back then? Why did God have them look at an image rather yeah. than him? Uh, wonderful question again, and and it is a bit of a head scratcher, isn't it? Uh, uh, God, not long before, had given His people very specific instructions not to make any images of animals, uh, people, or anything to worship, to lift up and give give honor to. So God had explicitly said, "Don't make stuff and worship. Don't make statues. Don't make idols. Uh, don't even." Uh, don't even decorate the temple with with images like that, so that you you don't you're not going to be uh, tempted to worship them. Um, but then uh, to to heal them or to save them, he, he tells them to go <laughs> make an image, make a snake of all things, and and lift it up on the pole and look at it, which uh, you can imagine may have looked very much like worship. Uh, a bunch of people who are looking to be saved, gazing at this image that is has been looked up. And uh, ironically, that's exactly what happened. So, um, so later on in, uh, in Kings, uh, one of the, uh, I'll just give you the reference, 2 Kings 18.4, um, it turns out that the bronze serpent stick with the, the snake on it had survived through the wilderness into Israel uh, and, and people had started worshipping it. They, they kept it, it, it happens again and again, all these special things. Um, uh, yeah, they, they'd started worshiping, uh, and, and one of the one of the holy kings uh, of of, uh, of Judah found it and broke it into pieces to stop the people from worshiping it. So back to the question: Why why would God do that? Why would He confuse it? Um, I, I think it's actually similar to what what I said in the last question. Um, so much of the Old Testament is deliberately pointing forward to the fulfillment. So God does things. Uh, through the story of Israel and the, the history of that nation, um, not just for, um, for them. Uh, and it was for them that that, that, ser that bronze servant was to teach them that it was nonsensical. Why should looking at something save you? Uh, it did teach them to trust God and do what he says. Uh, but very clearly, God was setting up a much bigger lesson, not just for that one generation of people in Israel, but for all these people that we could look back on. Um, so so in, in the book of Hebrews, we read about this, that many of the trials and things that God's people went through in the wilderness happened so that we might learn the lesson from it. So God, God actually put this nation um, through these trials and tests for their own good, but also for the good of all his people that come so that we might look back and see it. And I think that's, this is another great example of that. Okay. Um, now, the next question comes from me. Okay. Uh, now this is something that so, uh, I, I love and loathe, and I think it's not just here in John, it happens elsewhere, but it feels to me like, like Jesus is, is almost deliberately messing with Nicodemus. So uh, mm. he, he's very confusing, he's saying things that, that you can't possibly expect Nicodemus to understand. I think he does that a bit with the Samaritan woman in the next chapter. Why does he do it? What's going on here? Yeah, so as we see Jesus interacting <coughs> with people, uh, occasionally he's crystal clear, can't be misunderstood, uh, but almost feels more often than not he's speaking in uh, pictures, roundabout phrases, things that you think, come on Jesus, you could have made this easier to understand for poor old Nicodemus. Uh, next chapter we're going to see for the, the Samaritan woman at the well, for example, we, he, he talks about things that you think they they can have no hope of understanding that. Um, I think I think uh, it's helpful here to reflect on what Jesus said about parables. Um, so these these stories that Jesus often tells. Um, one of the I think common misconceptions about parables is uh, um, louder. Yeah. Uh, one of these common misconceptions about parables is that uh, they they're for making a complex thing simple or making something that's hard to understand clearer. Uh, but when Jesus explains, his disciples say, why, why do you speak in parables and then only, uh, only tell us the, the, the interpretation privately afterwards? Jesus actually says, 
it's, it's a bit of a sifting process. Um, uh, so the, the phrase he uses, it's, it's, he, he doesn't, well, I, I won't try and quote it exactly, but effectively he says, uh, it, it's so that when I'm speaking to the masses, only those who, who are truly tuned in will hear it. Um, and and I, I think that's what he's doing here with Nicodemus. I think that's what he's doing with the woman of the well. Uh, that if you really want to understand Jesus, you've got to pay attention and, and you've, got to, you've, got to, you've got to really seek him. Uh, mm. So I think that's, that's one part of it. He actually wants them to think on these things. Uh, and, and we see Nicodemus doing that, which, as I said, I, I find super encouraging to see how, mm. while you might have thought Nicodemus would walk off a bit cheesed off, that, you know, oh, well, I've come with these questions, I've humbled myself, and all I got with some, you know, crazy stories and unclear answers. He left intrigued. He, 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 he stood up for Jesus later on. He, he uh, took Jesus' body off the cross. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it did that for Nicodemus. But the other part of it that's going on is, is again, like the Old Testament, God was doing things for people, uh, for, for all his people forever. Same, same with the New Testament. Uh, John, well, God... Jesus knew that this event was going to be recorded, that these words were going to be recorded for us, for all his people. Uh, and when we received these words, they were coming packaged in the Gospel of John. Uh, we received them not on their own uh, as a Jewish person who doesn't even know whether Jesus is going to die, let alone rise again. We get these words packaged in the Gospel where we, we know about Jesus' birth, we know where he'd come from, we know that he was the fulfilment of David's line, this great king. We, we get all the way through John and, and the purpose statement of John so that people might believe. We see his death, we see his resurrection. We know about Pentecost in Acts, about when Jesus eventually did send his, um, send his spirit to all his people. So, so we're not re reading this in a vacuum like Nicodemus. And I think, well, we know that Jesus, being God, knew that. So a lot of what he said wasn't for the benefit, in this case, I think pretty clearly, didn't benefit Nicodemus a whole lot there and then, but was for Nicodemus' benefit later as he looked back on it, and certainly for our benefit as we look at it in the, in the context of everything mm. that, that had happened. Okay. Um, let me give you another question. Uh, so, Kiara asks, uh, when Jesus talks about being born of the Spirit, is he referring to that initial sanctification that gives rise mm. to faith? Uh, so simply the opening of the eyes to believe in Jesus, uh, or as opposed to the ongoing progressive sanctification by the Spirit, or, or is it both? Mm. Yeah, great, great question. Uh, I think uh, initially and, and first, absolutely, that it, it has to be at least the first one. Uh, the, the initial opening of the eyes, of the spiritual eyes. Um, so, and, and just to, to quote Jesus... Uh, from John 3, no one can see uh, the, is it the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven in that one uh, unless they're born again. Uh, and then down in verse 5, unless they're born of um, spirit, water and of spirit. Uh, so, so absolutely, it, 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 it is at least, at the very least, that first one. You, you need the spirit's work of regeneration, of uh, renewing and bringing to life. The, the spiritual eyes, the heart, so that we can see what Jesus has done and see it in a saving way, not just understand it, but, but understand the significance of it, what that means for us, and truly accept it. Uh, but we, but I, think it, I think it is also talking about that, that ongoing work of the Spirit. Um, so I think, yeah, this is a, a both-and uh, situation. Um, it's a little bit like the filling of the Spirit that we, we see through the New Testament, uh, that... That, that there seems to be an initial filling of the Spirit when you are when you're converted. That's, that's how it's described. Now, clearly the Holy Spirit works, um, well, maybe not so clearly, but the Holy Spirit is working in people, even leading up to their conversion, you know, in the, the progressive uh, opening of the heart, opening of the spiritual life, uh, uh, eyes. But, but when, when, when a person comes to that saving faith in Jesus, we read that the Holy Spirit fills that person. Uh, but then we read that uh, Paul, on numerous occasions, quote, filled with the Holy Spirit, began to preach or teach or do some other action. So Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit already, uh, was again filled with the Holy Spirit as he, as he faithfully obeyed God, as he followed Jesus. 
and, it, and especially as he sought to serve Jesus. Um, so I think this is a similar thing that's going on. You're not going to get born again and again and again and again. You're born again, but, but you, want to, you want to grow in that. You want to be continually filled with that spirit yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, that began. Yeah. All right. So both and. Um, all right. So Glennis has sent through uh, with a couple of comments. Sure. First one, like the haircut. Thanks, Glennis. <laughs> Uh, it's actually a biblical reason I got this. Proverbs twenty one nineteen. If you want to look it up, uh, two Colin no Slam has washed his hands very clean. They are white, excellent. Uh, it's an unusual gift that he's given us. Uh, and the third one is the real question, and it's this: Is there any connection with the serpent in Genesis one mm. and the bron- bronze snake that the Israelites uh, have to look up to? Um, to be saved in numbers, and then and then again with Jesus on the cross. So, is Genesis one? I think she means three. The serpent mm. connected to, um, to mm. the, both of those stories, or either of those stories. I'll have this time over to you, Rob. What do you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think in a particular way. There's a thematic association, but I wouldn't want to press too hard on it. That's my simple answer. I'd run with that. There's, there's no direct lines drawn unless I've missed something really obvious. Um, but I haven't, haven't found that connection in anything I've read. But yeah, good, good little pick up. And, and we do want to pick up those things when we see those patterns. It's good to ask the question. Sometimes it'll be just, no. They just happen to both be serpents. It does seem curious that God used a serpent of all things. Yeah, yeah, look, so... Uh, associating with God's judgment and their rebellion, a serpent. It's nice, but I don't, yeah, I don't think we'd yeah. make too much of it. Spec- I mean, you, you think connections again, uh, so the, the connections we do have that Jesus made is that this serpent was pointing forward to him being lifted on the cross, and we read that on the cross, Jesus became a curse for us so that we would be lifted from the curse which we see in that serpent passage in Genesis, Genesis 3, the, the, the curse that was ultimately, uh, well, was brought on humanity by humanity, but, but Satan as the serpent was involved in that. That could be there. Again, I'd, I'd probably want to ask some deeper thinkers who've done a whole lot more Bible reading and study on that before I'd lean too, too heavily. Hmm. There you go. Well, so that's all of the questions that we've had, uh, unless someone's really quick. But I think that's probably enough there. But as always, I want to encourage you to, to keep connecting with us. So uh, if you have a question tomorrow, if you, you, something pops into your head, don't feel like oh, it's too late, the q and is over, give us a call. Uh, we'd love to chat with you. Send us a message through Facebook if you don't have the number. Uh, we'd love to connect and, and keep chatting about stuff. Uh, and I'm really excited because uh, we stopped uh, kind of in the middle of this passage, John 3.15, mm. and that means that next week we kick off with John 3.16, perhaps the most famous verse in the Bible. Uh, So I'm looking forward to catching up with you all over that one. But for this week, that's all. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time.